This is a micrograph of a CMOS sensor array captured with a microscope by Mike Tool of the SIRT Observatory at the University of Arizona. On the left, we see a macroscopic image of the array, and on the right, we've zoomed in to resolve the individual pixels, which in this case are 5.3 microns apart. If we're taking a picture with uh, room light, the ambient radiance is around 50 watts per meter squared. We'll discuss in chapter seven how this is related to the irradiance on the camera sensor, but basically the irradiance on the sensor is close to the object radiance. Here this translates to 260 watt picowatts per sensor. For visible light, there's about 10 to the 19th photons per watt, so the irradiance is about 1 billion photons per second per pixel. If we integrate for one millisecond, we might get a million photons, but we lose light due to the surface reflectance of the object, maybe around 10%, and due to the structure and color filtering on the array. So in practice, we might get between 10,000 and 100,000 photons per pixel. Now, this translates into a similar number, maybe around 100,000 to 10,000 electrons captured within the pixel, which is a pretty good wall capacity for a CMOS sensor, which is more typically 5,000 to 20,000. The point for present purposes is that the detector detects a finite number of uh, electrons. The photon that generates the electrons is a quantum of light. Counting photons leads to quantum fluctuations or noise. Let's discuss what this means for computational imaging. Computational imaging. Episode nine, noise. Today we're talking about noise. Chapter two concerns how to build a forward model. Noise models are central to forward models. By definition, we don't know the value of noise, but characterizing its distribution is essential to computational imaging. Here we see ChatGPT's idea of the sources of noise in an electronic amplifier. Thermal noise is caused by the random motion of charge carriers due to thermal agitation. Shot noise arises from discrete nature of photons and charge and has a Poisson distribution. Flicker noise involves some kind of memory in the system and is caused by various microscopic processes, such as fluctuations in the number of charged characters, carriers or their mobility. Burst noise is associated with imperfections in, in semiconductor devices, such as impurities or defects in the crystal lattice. Environmental noise could be radio, radio frequency noise or other environmental factors that could come into our measurements. So we need to model all of these noise sources in order to build a model for how the computational imaging system works and to simulate and compare different modeling systems. Here's a visualization of the specific noise sources. One over F noise is associated with kind of memory back, you know, feedback within a system and occurs in all kinds of different physical systems. Thermal noise is caused by these thermal fluctuations. So we'll need to carefully manage these noise sources through system design. As discussed in the intro, the most fundamental source of noise in optical systems is quantum shot noise. Here we're modeling this by a stream of dots. We have a bunch of blue dots and every once in a while a red dot. The probability that a dot is red is 0.1. If we run the code again, we get a different set of dots. The number of dots that we would expect to see would be n bar is equal to the probability that a dot is red times the total number of dots we're going to look at. Now, in this case, we might think of this as a time series, and we could say that the time between each dot, pair of dots is delta t, uh, and the total time is t, so n should be equal to the total time divided by delta t. If we make delta t smaller and smaller, n would get bigger and bigger. Now, these two first two experiments, we saw seven dots. If we run again, we get 10 dots. Here's an example with 12 dots. The spacing is non-uniform. The overall probability of getting n photons is the binomial distribution shown here. Now this uh, n bar over n, that's the probability uh, that any given dot is red. And then we take that to the nth power, that's the probability that little n dots are red. Now the dots that are not red have a probability of one minus n bar over n, the probability of not being red or being blue. We take that to the n minus n power. So this is probability that n dots are red and n minus, big N minus little n are blue. Now this, this term out in front is the number of combinatorial ways that we can uh, rearrange the dots. So this is the binomial distribution, the probability that we get exactly little n red dots. Now, 
we can make delta t smaller and smaller, which would make n bigger and bigger, and we can take n to the limit where n goes to infinity. This binomial distribution turns into this Poisson distribution. You notice this term, 1 minus n bar uh, over big N, that is uh, e, basically, as n goes to infinity. So we take that to the n power. We have e to the minus n bar uh, from, from this term, and then these two terms turn into this n bar to the nth power divided by n factorial. So we can test this distribution. What we show in this plot is we've, we've gone and uh, used uh, uh, some code to draw a selection of uh, uh, 100 examples of uh, uh, how many uh, photons we get. And this histogram shows that, uh, you know, 10 times uh, we got, so it looks like 103 uh, photons. Some number of times we got 100 photons. Um, and then we could try this again. Let's try it with a thousand examples. The solid curve is the uh, Poisson distribution. And we see as we draw more and more samples, our sample distribution tends to look more and more like the Poisson distribution. The code to generate this is shown here. We use this uh, Poisson distribution built into uh, Python. Uh, in this case, the mean would be 100. And the number of samples was uh, 10,000 in this example to give us this, something like the Poisson distribution. Here are some properties of the Poisson distribution. If we sum all possible values of the number of photons, we should get one because uh, that the sum of the probability distribution is equal to one. We take the mean of the Poisson distribution, we get n bar, the mean number of photons we expect to uh, detect. And we take the expectation value of n squared, we get n bar squared uh, plus n, which means that the variance or the, the um, variance is equal to n bar. Let's look at the Poisson distribution for different values of the mean. Here we're again using this uh, Python code to generate simulated uh, Poisson measurements uh, with different values of the mean. So here the mean is 100 right here, and our variance should be square root of 100, about uh, 10. And then uh, here's a mean of 10, and so the mean is here, and the variance is around uh, 3, square root of 10. Here the mean is 3, and so the variance would be around 2, so it's very difficult for us to say that we would get any significant figures in our measurement in this case. Uh, here's an example where we've drawn uh, with a mean of 1,000 uh, a bunch of samples, and the mean should be um, around 30, which would be somewhere around here. And you see it again follows the, the Poisson distribution. So that's an extremely brief introduction to Poisson noise. We have these other noise sources, the thermal noise, the 1 over F noise, uh, environmental noise, well, those terms are going to add together and typically they'll become a, uh, a normal distributed noise source under the central limit theorem. Typically we would assume those noise sources have a, a zero mean because uh, if they didn't have a mean, if they had a if they had a bias, we could add that to the signal. Uh, so we are going to add this normal distribution noise to the shot noise to have our overall model for how measurement is going to work. Let's compare these different noise sources. Here we're modeling the spatial image structure of Poisson noise. So actually each one of these images is uniform. It's a, we just have a uniform one value in a square. At the upper left, we're assuming that the signal level is 10 photons per pixel and 100 photons per pixel, 1,000 photons per pixel, and 10,000 photons per pixel. So as we get up to uh, uh, 10,000 photons per pixel, we see that the noise level becomes small compared to the overall signal value, but we still see some fluctuations even in this uh, image at the lower right. We can understand the structure of those fluctuations uh, by looking at the uh, signal values themselves. So here we've rasterized those squares that I just showed you. And at the upper curve, uh, we're showing the signal levels at you know, 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000 photons. And you see these uh, fluctuations here, even for the 10,000 photons. And we would expect those fluctuations to be on the scale of 100 photons, where we've measured 10,000 photons. Now, in this uh, lower curve, we've normalized uh, the, each of the curves at the top by the, by the number of, uh, expected number of photons in each pixel. So the blue curve is the uh, um, 10 photons per pixel, and here we're seeing fluctuations on the scale of three photons. And then the next one is uh, 100 photons per pixel. Uh, we, we expect to see fluctuations uh, on the scale of uh, one tenth of 100, and then uh, the, the the blue and green curves, we would expect for a thousand photons, we'd see one one thirtieth, and for the red, we'd see um, a one one hundredth of the of the signal level. So this red curve should be fluctuating at about 0.1. Uh, 
Now we can compare this with the Gaussian uh, distribution. Here's a, a, a Gaussian uh, noise with the same kind of uh, variance. If we have 10 photons per, per pixel, uh, the uh, the uh, width of the Gaussian uh, is a is a fluctuation of about one, so we see a substantial fluctuation. But as we go to uh, um, a larger number of photons, the signal gets very large, but this the uh, noise is not growing with the signal because the, the noise is strictly additive, so the noise becomes invisible in the 100,000 photons per pixel case in the Gaussians. Here we're comparing at the top uh, the signal levels for the, the noise levels for Poisson normalized to the expected number of photons with the Gaussian case at, at the bottom. Now, the interesting case here, the, in the interesting point here is that uh, what we see is that the signal to noise level drops linearly as we increase the signal level uh, for the normal distributed noise, but it goes as the square root of n, so the signal to noise ratio goes like the square root of n uh, for the uh, Poisson distributed signal, so we still have some variation even uh, when we have uh, 10,000 photons, where we'd expect to see a fluctuation of around 100 photons. If you think about the number of levels we would need to digitize the 10,000 photons, if we have a noise of 100, then we might have like 100 signal levels, basically, at 10,000 photons. Now, as we go down, you know, at 100 photons, we would have an order of 10 signal levels. Those add cumulatively. Typical uh, digitization in imaging systems is 8-bit, meaning there's 256 levels. That really is very sufficient for numbers of photons up to about 10,000. If you get to 100,000 photons, suddenly maybe 8-bit uh, coding is not sufficient. But you see that the single level that we'd want to encode is going to be proportional, or the number of levels you want to encode is going to be defined really by this signal-to-noise ratio. Understanding and modeling this noise is essential to us in our next step, which is to talk about resolution in imaging systems. Now, in addition to the noise sources we've talked about, there are all kinds of other things that are treated as noise in imaging systems called fixed pattern noise, meaning that there's some non-uniformity, for example, in the photodiodes in the photodiode array, for example, that I showed you in the intro. These sources of noise are systematic. They're not really noise. They, if there's something that occurs every time you make an image, that's just an artifact in the imaging system. So they can be taken out by uh, careful uh, sampling strategies. For example, a correlated double sampling is used to model the output of a signal with a uh, optical signal applied and without an optical signal. By subtracting the background, you can remove fixed pattern noise from imaging systems. So there are ways to remove what you might think of as noise sources. And it's really only these things that are fundamentally random that we want to count as noise sources. When people talk about imaging systems, they talk about resolution. Well, what does this mean? Here's an image of the base of a palm tree taken in Tucson, Arizona, right outside our optic building. Here's another image of the palm tree. The image on the right is actually the image on the right, or the image on the right is the image on the left processed with a neural network. Here's details of the images. So we've improved the resolution somehow. We've made the image uh, look better. Um, well, we need to noise model to understand how to do this and how this is allowed. What we're going to see in the next lecture is that noise models are fundamental to our ability to model and understand the limits of resolution in imaging systems. So we'll see you next time to discuss that.